progression. Like back when I started marketing, they'd ask us for leads. Hey, marketing, go get leads. And then say, you know what, marketing, go get qualified leads. And then say, hey, marketing, go get pipeline. And then they'd say, go get pipeline and closes. <laughs> and then it was, go get pipeline that closes efficiently, right? So we started looking at the cost. And they said, go get pipeline that closes efficiently and results in happy customers. And then it was go get pipeline that closes efficiently and results in happy customers who expand, right? It's our job to tell a better story. And always remember, it's the risk takers that are rewarded. People are sick and tired of being marketed to, and they're sick and tired of being sold. The single biggest story today in sales and marketing is how our customers are buying different products. Hello, Dave, and welcome to the Growth Hub podcast. Hi, Rita. Hi, Seya. It's great to be here. Fantastic. So before we get into the topic of the day, I, I have to ask you, you have such a phenomenal career. You've been a CMO, you've been a CEO, you're on board of several different companies. Which of those roles do you feel is the most you, what is the most comfortable with you? Sure. So, so, so while I like them all and, and each have their pros and cons, um, the, the head and shoulders answer above the rest is a CMO. Um, I think first it's just my DNA. You'll, you'll figure that out. I feel like I was born with it. I, I enjoy going grocery shopping, right? That, that's a big sign that you're a marketer. Like you spend hours looking at the positioning and packaging and arrangement. And, uh, so, uh, the next is uh, the CMO role. You get to be part of a team. The CEO really is lonely. It's a, it's, it's a trope, I know, uh, but there's a lot of truth to it. It's, it's a hard job. Uh, the director job is great. I mean, it's great to be able to give advice, but but you're you're in the press box, not on the playing field, right? So and and I like being on the playing field. So uh, it, it, marketing is basically my passion area. So I view myself as a marketing person who happens to have ten years of CEO experience, <laughs> not as a CEO who happens to have ten years of marketing experience. Do you actually still get to do marketing? Yes. Um, yes, actually. And so I work with, obviously, one of the things I advise companies on is marketing. So I spend a lot of time helping companies with marketing. And and look, the fun part of marketing, like, you know, positioning, packaging, strategy, as opposed to, you know, nine box performance reviews, right? <laughs> and layoffs and, and, and all the difficult things you have to do as a manager. So yeah, as an advisor, I love that I, right now I get to work on marketing and I get to work on the hardest part and the funnest part for, you know, 10 companies at once rather than doing everything for one. Great. Um, you're also currently um, something called an executive in residence at the, the Balderton Capital, a venture capital investment company. Can you tell us a little bit about your role there? What do you do? Sure. So, so I work uh, with Balderton and uh, it, it, EIR can mean one of two things, by the way. It, it, typically, it means entrepreneur in residence. And it also, in my case, it could be an executive in residence. The, the difference between the two is the former is looking for another job and the second, the latter isn't, <laughs> basically. Uh, so an entrepreneur in residence right, is waiting for a team to come by to go join or a company that has a missing part that they want to go fill. So they're kind of watching the deal flow, helping with diligence and, and maybe jumping in. Whereas an, an EIR, executive residence uh, like me, I, I'm not really looking for another operating job. I, I want to play in the game, right? I, I want to be able to help people out, but but I, I'm really just hanging out at Balderton, helping companies with challenges and nothing more. As such, by the way, I do two things. One is advice and, and the other is kind of thought leadership and content generation, which, which I know we'll talk about here today. The reason why we wanted to have you on our podcast as a guest is um, uh, something that you worked on last year uh, and it came out in November, I think. And that's the Founder's Guide to B2B Sales. You, were, you wrote that. Um, so first of all, why a sales guide specifically for founders? It's so two reasons. And when, when we started the project, it wasn't. Uh, but, but I have a rule of thumb, I, I teach marketers, which is always start with the audience, always. Uh, because marketers and people in general have a tendency to start with what's left over. 
right? Oh, I need to make a presentation. Oh, I have some slides left over from the customer meeting last week, or I have some slides left over from the analyst meeting last week. So I open that deck in PowerPoint or Google Slides and I start changing it. And, and that is, in my humble opinion, a terrible way <laughs> to, to make a presentation, right? Uh, and this is some great marketing disasters happen that way because um, you'll, you'll use those slides at the sales training and the salespeople will say, that sounds like an analyst deck. And it, 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 it does because it is, you know? <laughs> so um, as I found myself making this project, the very first thing I did was to say, who's the audience? Because you're going to write the, the thing differently if it's for the head of sales or if it's for an aspiring seller or if it's for a CEO or if it's for a founder. Um, and, and I said, well, I think we should write it for founders. Ballerton loves to be super founder friendly, right? We'd love to be very supportive of founders and partner with them in growing their business. So I said, Let, let's do it for founders. And, and what can I further assume about founders? And the answer is in today's world, they're typically product oriented. So now all of a sudden I've got a point of view, which is, oh, wait a minute. I'm trying to take a discipline, sales, which is kind of scary and mysterious, and explain it to a founder who probably comes from a product oriented background. Uh, and, and that was what that was the point of view that drove the whole project. So um, based on that, um, what do actually the founders need to know about selling? So what are the key points you wanted to give them and and want you, them to actually take on board? Founders, there's three things, in my opinion. One is they just have to go do it. But right? once again, we're back to the point of view. If I'm assuming a product oriented founder, I'm going to assume somebody who isn't necessarily comfortable with doing sales, right? Because they haven't, they've spent their career in product and product management, working with engineers. So the, the first thing founders need to understand, and most but not all do, is, is that, you know, it's gonna sound like a Nike commercial, you need to just do it, right? You need to get out and go sell. Whether or not you're comfortable, I don't care. <laughs> you, you need to go do it. it. So that's the first thing. The, the second thing is that, you know, there's a, there's a wide misconception that sales is about talking. Um, and, and sales is not, according to some recent stats I saw, uh, I think it was from Gong, that sales, you know, good sellers listen 57% of the time. And, and there's an old adage in sales that we have two ears and one mouth, use them in proportion, right? So we should be listening two thirds of the time. And so that's the second thing I think founders need to know about actually selling, right? First, you need to go do it, whether you want to or not. Second, selling is about listening, not talking. Um, in fact, my argument for really good answers to questions is simple. It gives you more time to listen. If somebody says, how does your Schmumble engine work? And it takes you 25 minutes to explain that, <laughs> right? That, that's 20 minutes you could have been listening. So, so I explain it in terms of opportunity cost. Um, and then the last thing is just, if you have to boil all of sales down to one word, it's curiosity. There's actually a sales methodology called selling through curiosity. And if you... Ask open-ended questions and you're genuinely curious and you listen to the answers, you could be at a highly effective seller. To find the human or kind of the, um, yeah, the human way and gen, yeah. what is it? What's the word in English? <laughs> Are you losing your English? <laughs> I am losing my English today, <laughs> sorry. Like being genuinely interested in someone actually, and that shows, and not, not really like pushing, but actually pulling. I will tell you a funny story. When I was a young tech support person, I noticed the company I worked at, the two most effective sellers were the top seller and the chief architect. And, and, and it was like, there's an old movie called The Andromeda Strain where you're trying to connect the pattern between a drunk and a baby. And I was literally like, what does the drunk and the baby have in common? Like, how can these two people both be incredible on sales calls? And the answer was the seller was genuinely curious right? Because they were a top seller and they knew they needed to be. And so was the chief architect. The chief architect had no pretenses. They didn't care about anything but solving the problem. So, so everybody else is an agenda or a boss or something to worry about. But the chief architect would be like, tell me what you're trying to do. Why are you trying to do it? What, what you know? And, and so very different backgrounds led them to the same place, which was one of extremely high sales effectively. You, you mentioned that um, founders today tend to be tend to have a product background. I was wondering if when you talk to these founders and you work with these companies, what is the hardest thing uh, about sales for them? Is it that they're uncomfortable with it and they haven't done it or is there, is there something else? 
it's going to be a very subtle answer, unfortunately, but, but, but the, I think the hardest thing is, look, in today's world, sales has been industrialized. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. And it, it's easy to kind of over-industrialize sales in the founder's mind. Like, I, I, what does that mean? A, a founder can show up and go, oh, sales is a funnel. Great. I understand funnels. Um, and funnels have layers and layers have conversion rates. And if you're not careful, you might think that your funnel is linear. And, and what I try to teach founders is if you happen to sell electronic toothbrushes online, you may have a linear funnel because somebody sees an ad, they click on it, they go to a landing page, they either click or don't, they watch the demo, they either buy or don't, and it's done, right? That's what I would call a linear funnel. In B2B software, the reality is, look, our Excel models are going to be funnels. The world, the better model is a popcorn machine, <laughs> which is we never know. We have all these kernels in. We have all this heat that we're applying underneath, and the kernels are kind of popping out randomly. And, and this is in marketing, the attribution problem. Attribution is literally like looking at a popcorn machine, watching a kernel pop, and saying, what made that kernel pop? I, I, I love that. I, love that. <laughs> I will, I'm, I'm going to steal that and use that example everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I love it. So that's that's the problem they have. They could be so linear, and it's like the linear is just a model, right? The reality is the popcorn machine. So that's hard for them because because they can go, oh, I love this sales stuff, because that funnel is super easy for them to understand. It, unfortunately, it's not reality. Great. So if a founder does not have a background in sales, what does it take for them to become become a good salesperson or the chief salesperson if they're the only one who's selling at the beginning at least so um i mean at the beginning it, it's all about the stuff we talked about earlier you got to get out there and do it you got you got to ask great questions you got to listen uh and that i mean the first chapter of the guide is focused literally on selling um for, for example by the way if i'd written it for cro's or ceos i might not have included that but for founders, it was like, you people probably need to know what to do on a sales call. So, so that's where we started. Um, I think, you know, the question leads to the question of when we go from kind of founder-led sales to sale-led sales, because I actually think those three things alone will take you a long way in founder-led sales. And, and then the question is, at some point, we need to hand off, right, to sales-led sales. And so we need to hire sellers. So to answer that question, I think it's about kind of three things, you know, Plan it, do it, manage it, basically. That you need to plan sales. Like you need to make a model. I, I call it a bookings capacity model. And you need to tie that to a marketing inverted funnel model. But you need to make these models, right? You have to kind of, as my grandfather used to say, plan your work and work your plan, right? <laughs> so, so you need to do that. Um, then you need to go out and do it, right? So, so you need to be involved in sales calls, as we've discussed. A lot of founders are a little over eager to hand that off too early. And, 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 you know, when do I stop selling? Answer, never, right? <laughs> you, you'll always, in my opinion, you should always be selling. Um, and then the last is just managing it. And managing sales is hard. And, and, and in fact, the nuance there is while I talk a little bit about managing sales, I actually also talk about how to manage your CRO. Because that, that once again, if you're a founder CEO, you're not a first line sales manager. I don't need to write a guide on how to manage a sales team, I need to write a guide on how to manage your CRO, which could be quite challenging. Mm. So, so, so those three things. So would you actually say that that advice applies to um, other people as well, like us marketers? So I think, you know, I think in general, yes. I mean, first, I'd say the guide for sure applies to marketers because the more marketing understands about sales, the better. Um, I think the planet do it management advice is pretty CEO specific. Uh, the do it advice is not right. And, and by the way, one of the nice things today is even if you can't go on sales calls, you can listen to them with tools like Gog or Chorus or Jiminy. You can drop yourself basically right in the middle of the football match, like standing on the field, right? <laughs> Watching things happen around you. Um, and that is super powerful. So, so I think that aspect is critical for everybody um, in, in terms of the managing it. Um, it's a little bit harder if you're sitting in another chair. I think it would be useful to you to understand how sales should be managed. Uh, and even for a seller, you know, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. One of the more common mistakes made in early stage startups is they try to do everything in one phone call. So once a week, they'll say, let's talk about the pipeline. Let's talk about the forecast. And let's talk about the, the ACME deal and how we're going to win it. 
And in my mind, those are in most professional sales managers' minds, those are actually three different meetings. Uh, a pipeline scrub should be about the pipeline, where we just look at every opportunity. A forecast call should be about the numbers. Where, where are we going to land this quarter, <laughs> right? Um, and a deal review could actually be a fairly large meeting where we're pulling people from across the organization to say, we're going to tell you about this deal. In some ways, a brainstorming session, what, how do you think we can win it? And just because the focus and the energy of the audience is different in those meetings, they should be separate. And whether you're the boss in charge or a participant, you should raise your hand and say, we should make this a dedicated meeting. We, this deal review is awesome. We should do it, you know, we should do it for an hour and a half and we should do it for three deals a week. I think that's a really great point. And it's something that um, I personally, it was almost like a mind blown situation. I, I'm, a, I'm a marketer and I am still a marketer, but I did um, a degree in sales management and international sales. And I think that was one of the most eye opening two years of my life because then, you know, everything was about sales and, and all these people came to talk to me about what, how they do and how they manage sales. And that has actually really, really helped af even after the degree when I'm working with clients and their sales teams and so forth. So I do, I do agree and I do recommend that marketers also understand not only sales in general and pipelines and things like that, but also the managing part of it. So we should all do like a sales degree. I? No, not necessarily <laughs> degree. I, maybe I should give you the, the uh, opportunity to answer that. <laughs> Look, I think the more marketers can understand about sales, the better. I think it's really hard to do purely by empathy, right? Like imagine you had a quota. It's not quite the same. Um, so I think hearing from people who did and hearing from people who managed is great. Um, there's a book whose name, of course, I can't remember right now that I was trying to look up that if, if you're a marketing person and you only, it's mentioned in the sales guide. So here's our incentive to read the guide. Um, but if you only had one book to read on sales, it would be that. And I want to try and find it. Uh, I'll try and find it. Give me, oh, yeah. There, uh, I got John McMahon wrote the book. I just need the title. Uh, what is the name of this book? Uh, give me two seconds. Ah, The Qualified Sales Leader. And the first, so I think marketers and sellers should read The Qualified Sales Leader because the first few chapters is very much kind of a walk in the footsteps approach. It's not theoretical. It's not looking down from above. It's kind of dropping you into the scene. <laughs> um, and it's great for building empathy. Uh, so a fantastic book. If I had other than my guide, of course, uh, if I only had one book to read, uh, I'd go to the qualified sales leader. Okay. Um, actually, we've been talking about founders and what does it take to for the founder to be good at sales. But if we think about this more generally about, you know, the sales force today, what do you think makes a good salesperson today? The good salesperson today, um, I think first it's going to be, I want to say a modern salesperson, a listener, not a talker, right? It, uh, second, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit consistent in my answers, but it makes things simpler, I think. But they need to be good at listening. They need to be curious. Um but I'll just give a demo of curiosity because because people may not understand what I mean by curious. I, I, I'm going to just fire a bunch of questions at you to, as a demo. So here we go. I'm curious, why did you decide to do this evaluation? I'm, I'm curious, who else are you evaluating? I'm curious, what other what process will we be using to conduct the evaluation? I'm curious, do you have any spreadsheets, templates, or artifacts you're using to run that process? I'm curious, what are the impacts of the problem we're trying to solve downstream? I'm curious, does the CFO know about this process? I'm curious, have you ever bought a deal of this size before at this company, right? Uh, I'm curious um, about the approval process. Who is involved in the approval process? I'm curious, do you have any major company events that are coming up that could impact my closing? I'm curious, is anyone going to be on vacation at the end of the quarter because they may not be here to sign my paperwork, right? Like almost any question you could have can be expressed as one of genuine curiosity from why are you buying this? Like from, literally from how do you make money, which is always one of my first questions when I meet a company, I just say, how do you make money? Because <laughs> if I don't understand that, I don't understand anything, right? So I need to understand how you, and, and people are, and maybe this cuts really back to your answer. To be curious, you can't be prideful. You can't be afraid of looking stupid, right? Uh, because to be curious, you need to show up and ask questions. I would argue that other people are afraid to ask because they're afraid of looking dumb. 
Um, and, and those fundamental questions are actually kind of money. So I, to be a great seller today, I think you need to be curious. I think you need to be great at questioning, great at listening. I also think you need to be process oriented. I mean, sales itself has, has industrialized, right? When I started in software, it was totally artisanal, right? We, we were hand crafting little you know, loaves of bread. We were making, you know, one, and now we, we have bread machines, right? <laughs> and, and we're pumping out lots of bread. So, I, and I think that transformation left a lot of people behind, but, but there's no question to me, the modern seller and the modern sales manager need to be industrial. Isn't that the same applies for the kind of modern marketers as well? So look, I, I once looked back over my career at what organizations were asking marketing for, and you can see this really interesting progression. Like back when I started marketing, they'd ask us for leads. Hey, marketing, go get leads. And then say, you know what, marketing, go get qualified leads. And then they say, hey, marketing, go get pipeline. And then they say, go get pipeline and closes. <laughs> and then it was, go get pipeline that closes efficiently. Right, so we started looking at the cost, and they said, "Go get pipeline that closes efficiently and results in happy customers." And then it was, "Go get pipeline that closes efficiently and results in happy customers who expand." Right, and in each case, we're taking marketer further and further down the accountability funnel. So it's been a fun journey, but that to me is literally 35 years of marketing. And let's not forget churn. Oh uh, yeah, well. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Customers who expand and don't churn. Or I could exactly. net it out to customers who get a high <laughs> NRR. <laughs> well, we oh want God. to we want to talk about sales and marketing and their alignment a bit more. But before we get to that topic, I I, I really want to talk ask you about something um, still related to sales skills because when you did list your the the most important skills that you thought that salesperson um, needs to have, what I'm hearing is you, there were a lot of people skills and how to communicate and interact and things like that. But for example, you know, reading through academic research at the moment, one of the big concerns there is that, you know, salespeople don't have the digital skills or the skills to use digital tools. And that's kind of hindering, hindering them back. So I'm wondering, uh, from your point of view, uh, how much has technology changed selling? Has it changed it at all? And how how important do you find um, these kind of technological skills for salespeople to have? So, so, so as, as we alluded to earlier, sales has changed radically, right, over, over the past 20, 30 years. Um, and, and if you had to summarize that in, in one word, it's from artisanal to industrial. Um, and, and that change is really hard on people, right? Imagine you're, you're a craftsperson who builds high quality, whatever is one at a time. And, and now all of a sudden you need to pump them out in volume. It, it changes everything. It's not a small change. Um, the first thing it does, I, I remember the first time it was probably the mid 1980s. The first time I heard the phrase quality is about process. And I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean? Um, but, but when you industrialize something, it's all about process, right? So we need to define a process. We need to measure a process. If there are problems, we need to put them in the process. Some salespeople are naturally process oriented. Many, the, the more the artisans are not. So, so that is the kind of macro transformation driving B2B sales. And, you know, process is all about measurement, analytics, and automation, right? And, and kind of CRM would be the poster child for V1 process. Right, that, that we took all the stuff that used to be on spreadsheets or on pieces of paper, um, and, and we put it in a database and put a front end on it and gave it some reporting <clears throat> and made Benny off a billionaire um, <laughs> in the process. So um, that was kind of phase one automation. And, and that's super important. And that left a lot of people behind. But, but that, and by the way, many startups today still are not good at that. And the biggest thing they get wrong is they don't put the foundations in place. You know, you'll ask them what a stage two opportunity is, and they want to have a good definition. Or you'll ask them the exit criteria. My, my favorite is one company I worked with had like five exit criteria for stage three. And I read them all. And I was like, you do know that I could win the deal before getting all of your five exit criteria for stage three, right? I could literally win the deal. <laughs> it would be easier to win the deal than it would be to do all these things. So, um, and that's not good foundations, right? Because if you want automation in place, you need to have... The whole thing is built on a foundation of definitions and standards. What, what, what does it mean to be upside? What does it mean to be pipeline? What does it mean to be stage three? 
What does a June 30th close date mean? What does $250,000 opportunity value mean? Right, each of those things, the meaning could be slightly different. So uh, that's the first phase. The second phase is the one we're in right now, which is really for me from an automation to intelligence, where you have tools, just for example, like Clary that helps you do forecasting. So, so I'm pretty good at, at the kind of old school forecasting and still do it, but, but I, I love Clary as a second opinion, right? Or, or a fifth opinion <laughs> on what the number is gonna be. And, and it works differently than, than my models do. So that's great. Uh, so we could have intelligence into the forecast. And, and along with it, you know, where to invest our time, which deals are winners that we should invest in, which deals are the like, losers where we're just kind of pouring time and money and, and we're going to lose anyway, right? So that's helpful. Uh, another example of intelligence would be um, conversation intelligence, which uh, as we talked about, I love um, because we can, we can hear, I mean, look, I'll tell you why I love conversation intelligence, because I always have. The first time I saw Gong, I was like, everybody needs this. And while there's lots of different brands, and I'm on the board of one, I'm on the board of Jiminy, but, but uh, everyone needs this stuff for three reasons. One, it helps marketing listen to their message go down in real time. Because marketing people, you know us, sometimes we can make stuff that sounds a little bit too much like a PR agency. Um, and, and you try that to a customer and they'll be like, what? What did you say? Can you say that in English? You know, <laughs> uh, super useful just to hear that. Um, the, the second thing it's useful for is all the alerting capabilities. All the tools have these alerting. So every time pricing comes up or every time competition comes up, I want to hear about it and hear what we said. So that's great for sales training and focusing. Um, Additionally, it can be used for forecasting, which was, a, I think, an accidental use case, which I, I think, because um, I didn't hear it from the vendors. I heard it from the customers the first time where it's like, well, I use this for forecasting because I can just look how much activity there is. And if it's near the end of the quarter, and there's no activity, probably not happening. Um, if it's near the end of the quarter, and there's a lot of activity. It is. And I was like, whoa, I, I don't think it was built for that. But what a cool use case. <laughs> so uh, and finally, it connects the E-suite to the ground reality. Because even in little companies, you can get so disconnected. I mean, I, I honestly believe that if you've never used a conversation intelligence tool, the first time you call the e-staff together, listen to a few calls, you literally want to crawl under the table. It, it's cringeworthy, right? It's like, oh my God, that was so bad. <laughs> and an and, and awesome wake-up call, right? Because you're now connected to ground reality and you have all these fancy decks and fancy things, but this was reality. And if reality makes you want to crawl under the table, then, then maybe we should do something about that. There is actually, in that founder's guide uh, on B2B sales, there is actually, um, a chapter there about marketing. So what it is, what is it about marketing that you wish that founders would understand? So I'll tell you some stories, you can edit them out, but this is a fun story, I think you'll like it. So, so when I left Business Objects, a good friend of mine had been kind of the head of sales and, and I was kind of the head of marketing and we both became CEOs. And, and I was, we kind of worried or wondered who was gonna have the rougher transition, right? Like, ooh, who's it going to be harder for? Because uh, the salesperson, I've had a number, I've run a forecast and had a number my whole career. Uh, I'm not afraid of carrying a number. And, and the marketing person, I was a little nervous because I hadn't done those things. And, and like, I don't know, maybe it's going to be easier for you than it is for me. Who knows? Um, as it turned out, I think it was easier for me because it's not that hard to learn the quantitative stuff if you're quantitative by nature, right? Like forecasting and managing numbers and pipeline it's actually really hard to learn marketing because it's kind of soft stuff. And, and like, so I would call him and say, how do I, you know, how do I do the forecast? And he would call me and say, how do I do positioning? And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Two very like, my different question, things. Yeah, my question is answerable in five minutes. Like your question, like, you know, whoa, we're gonna, you know, we spent a long time talking about positioning. So I think to answer the question directly without the story, um, I think marketing is misunderstood basically, right, right? And I think marketers are part to blame for that. Some of us like to hide behind the kind of black magic guru, like go away, stay out of marketing, we're, we're, you know, leave us alone because it's all voodoo that you don't understand and couldn't possibly understand because you're not in the, 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 the tribe, right? So just go away. There's those, those kind of marketers. 
So, so they, they help make it misunderstood. Um, even the phrase marketing guru, right? You never hear sales guru. How come, how come marketing is gurus and sales doesn't, right? <laughs> um, so so we, we are in part responsible ourselves for this problem. But, but, but basically the problem is marketing is not understood and people, CEOs don't like to invest in things they don't understand. So, so my opinion is we better demystify it if we want to get money um, because the hiding behind the cloak of secrecy and confusion doesn't work. So uh, my, my general goal for marketing is to demystify it. And, and I try to tell people, I mean, there's this section of the guy called the world's shortest marketing primer. And it just says marketing is about three things, right? Why buy one, right? Why would I ever buy one of these? What are the generic benefits of buying it? Why buy mine, i.e. differentiation, right? And, and I use two examples all the time, but why buy one is soup is good food. There actually was a 1970s marketing campaign by Campbell's Soup, which is soup is good food. There's no better example of category benefit marketing, <laughs> right? Uh, and then bags fly free is a, is a Southwest Airlines promotion, right? It's differentiation. Why should I buy a ticket on Southwest versus United? Because on Southwest, bags fly free. So, so that's that's why buy mine. The first message is why buy one. And the last, which people often miss, is, is why give me the time of day, <laughs> right? Like, why do I even want to spend a minute listening to you talk? And that is, to me, mapping to buyer priorities. So if you're a CDO and you care about building data culture, you should talk to me because I want to tell you how we help build data culture. And I just hit your number one priority. That's why you give me the time of day. And, and I think, Look, there's marketers make a lot of mistakes on those things. Premature differentiation is, is classic, where, where somebody shows up and goes, what is it? And they start explaining why theirs is better. And they're like, I have no idea what it is. I don't care why yours is better. I'm not even sure if I want to buy one. And, and you're waxing poetic and technical about why it's better. I don't care. And conversely, I've seen companies where I'm going to buy one. Tell me why yours is better. And they spend 10 minutes explaining why to buy one. <laughs> and the person's like, do you have like stuff in your ears? Did you not hear what I said? So, uh, and then lastly, if you don't have good mapping to buyer priorities, they don't want to come to your events, right? Because you're talking about things that they don't care about. So, so that, that to me is the primer. And I, and I think we need to demystify it. That is such a great, great story and great stuff that you mentioned. Um, can we actually tap into the whole um, sales and marketing di- uh, misalignment? Because this is my favorite sure. topic and I, I could talk I, about this. I forever. just want to say this is a topic that Say and I talk all the time about. I'm completely bored out of my mind with it because yeah. I feel like we've been talking about it for years and years and years. <laughs> and Say is always like, no, that's exactly why we need to be talking about it. Exactly. <laughs> and I love talking about it because I want to hear people's opinions on it and what we actually could do about it. But you mentioned just now about the kind of the guru and dis- demystifying and soft skills and all that is that the problem that we have that we're not taking i don't know why are we misaligned like, still so i think look i think it's a great question i think it's sad that we still have to talk about it but we still have to talk about it <laughs> See? <laughs> See? <laughs> so i'm going to emphasize with both of you but, but no, every day, I mean, I work with scores of companies and, and this comes up all the time still. I, I think there's three reasons why they get misaligned. Um, the first is stovepipe goals. And maybe it's gonna be two reasons, but as CEO, if I tell the marketing person, ultimately I can say all kinds of things about, oh, I'd like you to support sales. I want you to align with sales. But if I end the conversation with giving you an OKR that says, go generate 100 stage one opportunities, or worse yet, go generate 100 MQLs, please God forgive me if anyone ever does that. But but if I I tell marketing their job is to generate stage one opportunities, I have just created a massive problem in my mind. So, So because unless you're a really good marketer, the tendency will be to say, the boss wants me to generate 100 S1s. I got them. I'm going to throw them over the fence. And as from an old song with a joke, once the rockets go up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department. <laughs> right? I don't care. Like you asked for 100. I threw 105. I'm a hero. That still happens. And, and, and I've literally been in meetings where I, I, I have the CEO, the CRO, and the CMO. And I ask the CRO, do they feel good about marketing sport? They say, no, I'm not getting what I want. 
I, I asked the CMO, are they achieving their goals? They say, yes, we're doing everything. And, and, and then I say, what are you measuring yourself on? And, and they say, well, I was supposed to get 100 S1s and I got 110. And I look at the CEO and go, this is your fault, right? You created this problem because you told the CMO to go get S1s and that was it. And they did what you said. Now, CMO, I wish you were a tad more enlightened, <laughs> right? So you understood that we want S1s to turn into S2s and we want S2s to close. And maybe we should work with sales to make sure we're doing that. But letter of the law, you did what you were told. So I, I dumped this one back on CEOs. I have seen many CMOs get caught and the CRO said to go right and the CEO said to go left. So what do I do? And my answer is go right. Maybe surprising to you. Go right every time. Um, but a lot of CMOs and good ones will go left because the boss told me to go left. So I went left. And the real problem, ironically, is that it's the, it, the CMO, if forced to choose a line with sales, I think that would be, if we wanted to diagnose this, uh, that's the solution. Um, because, and here's the argument for it. If things don't work, and I'm listening only to the CEO, the CRO will be out for my head. <laughs> the CRO will be, let's kill this marketer and get a new one. I don't like this one. And you'll be done. Um, the converse, if you're not listening to the CEO and you're working closely with the CRO, when the CEO goes, I think we should get a new CMO, the CRO goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> this person is supplying me with what I want. So it may be counterintuitive, but I think, I'm not going to say all I'll just say there are two reasons. I said three earlier. I'm going to make it simpler. There's two. One is accidental CEO misalignment creation, and it happens all the time. Um, and the CMO needs to call it out quickly. It needs to go to the CRO. It may be subtle, right? I make things simple by saying left and right. It's awful, very subtle alignment. Hey, I really want us to spin up an ABM program. CRO, is that important to you? Eh, kind of, right? Salespeople they don't want to rock the boat. They want to be politically correct, but kind of means no, right? <laughs> kind of means no, because I, I, if it was important to them, they would have told me already, right? So, so you can get these misalignments um, that marketing needs to be super tuned into, and they need to, in, in my mind, get the three of the people together and say, we're misaligned. We don't know it, but we're misaligned. Um, the other way to do it is if the CEO won't come around, just listen to the CRO. Swear to God, it's the, it's the only way to do it. So did you just this, tell every, sorry, did you just tell everybody to ignore their CEO? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> I said in the event of conflict that appears irreconcilable, right? If, if you put it out there and you're forced to choose, go align with sales. Because if you align with the CEO, you will be gone in six to nine months. Uh, your, your odds of lasting are very low. Um, be, because of the process I outlined, which is if sales starts missing numbers. They're going to come for you, and, and and you can say, "But I did what you told me." And this is always the the executive dilemma. But imagine yourself getting fired. You can say, "But I did what you told me," and, and what is any boss going to say back? You're a VP. You're a CRO. Your job is to get results, not do what you're told. <laughs> and you didn't get results, right? So, so and this is I sometimes call this directors, VPs thinking like directors is the other way to think about it. Like directors are allowed to say that in my mind. If you told me to do something and I did it and I executed it well, it was a terrible idea. Hey, I'm a director. <laughs> I'm a director of events. You told me to run an event. I ran the event. It went professionally. I did what I was told. The event was a disaster because none of our leads showed up. That's not my fault. Director can play that card. A VP cannot. A CMO cannot. Because ultimately on that very last day, it's going to be your job is to get results. And so I'm not really saying ignore the CEO. I'm saying get results which may entail that I'll make this gentler. If you have to pay lip service in one direction and put real energy in the other, I'd give the lip service towards the CEO. Yeah, we're on that. You know, I wouldn't forget about it. It'd be on the list. I'd put some effort, right? But but I would call up the CRO and say, what do you want to do? Because we're going to live or die together. Um, and, and basically, I am chained. the way I view it is we're chained together. We're going to live and die together. So what do we want to do? And, and, and you know what? The number one thing we should do is we should walk in together to the CEO's office and explain what we need to do. That, that's the, the more positive approach. <laughs> so essentially, it's up to the CMO and CRO to get over the misalignment issue and start working together. It's their responsibility to make it happen. I think it's great. Look, I, I tell, I'm going to play both sides on this, which is I tell CEOs all the time, don't do this to your CRO and CMO. Right? Don't do it. Look for it. Be careful for subtle misalignment. 
um, particularly because the salespeople won't disagree, right? Sa salespeople are very agreeable, right? They're, they're going to pretend there's no misalignment. No, no, we're all aligned on this. It's great. Um, and, and so the CMO, you know, you need to be very careful to, to look for misalignment. The other thing I would say is like sometimes there is just genuine misalignment. That's not the CEO's fault where marketing just wants to do. I mean, this is the other case where marketing wants to do cool marketing. ABM is cool. I want to do ABM. Or worse yet, I know ABM, and when your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? Or I'm really good at digital. So regardless of what the situation is, digital is the answer. Or regardless of what the situation is, events is the answer. Um, and this is why it's so important as a marketer to be broad, because because if we have 15 tools in your bag, I want you to know how to use all of them, not because you might actually need them all, but because I don't want you to be biased in tool selection. Right. <laughs> right. I, I want you to be able to look at a business situation and go, oh, this requires corporate communications and uh, content marketing, or, or this requires digital marketing and uh, this requires messaging, whatever it is. And the more you're only comfortable with three of the 10 tools, the more those are the tools you're going to be to recommend. And, and, and that's as a CEO, terrifying. Right. <laughs> So you keep talking about CMO and CRO, but one of the things that I think I've seen, I don't know if you've seen this, but one of the things I've seen is the rise of the title chief growth officer. And, and often it's either two ways. They have a sales background, but no experience in marketing, or they have a marketing background and no sales experience, but then they are put in charge of both. And I, I sometimes wonder if that, that is, uh, the title is brought in because they want to put sales and marketing working together better and align them better. So um, I'm wondering, what's your view on this? Uh, is is that the way to go or is that too much for one C-suite role? So I, I'm in general. So, so first, I think the evolution of titles has been really fun of late. Like uh, one of my favorite titles is performance marketing as a VP. And I'm always like, oh, if there, you have a VP of performance marketing? I I'd like the other job. <laughs> 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 Can I have the other job? <laughs> I want the non-performance marketing. Right? So there's a chief growth officer. Can I be the chief non-growth? You know, <laughs> I, I want to be in charge of everything that's not accountable. Um, so... Uh, some of it is just my, my cynicism with titles and naming, but but I do think we do these things. Look, sometimes when it's just a naming issue, I, I, I think it's a reminder. Like when we talk about performance marketing, I think of that as a reminder. It's not that the rest of marketing is not measured on performance, but it's a reminder that you are, right? So, so I think chief growth officer, as you describe it, is less of a reminder and more of an actual structure. Like, like I'm not just changing a title. Like at Salesforce, we called customer success, customers for life. That was a reminder to me. It had the same duties, same structure in many other orgs. Chief growth officer, as you define it, is combining sales and marketing into one. And I think that is a bad and brute force approach to the alignment problem. Um, I think it's brute force because you're basically giving up the CEO. <laughs> you're saying, I can't get these people to work together. So, so we're going to put it all under one person. Um, and, and like it or not, that's going to hide problems. So, so in some ways, as CEO, design your org chart to generate the conversations you want to have. Same thing could be said between product and engineering, right? We could put product and engineering under one, but I'd actually like to have a conversation between one group who thinks the market needs these things in the product and another group who needs to build them. That's a conflict I want to be involved in. <laughs> I, I really want to understand. And ditto for sales versus marketing. I would like to be involved in that conversation if, for example, marketing thinks we're generating lots of opportunities that are falling on the floor and sales isn't working on them because we've got a process problem. I want to hear about that. I don't want that swept under the rug. So design your org to generate the conflicts you want to hear about. And, and when you combine, so there's two arguments I have against it. When you combine sales and marketing, you're now silencing a lot of potentially very informative and very healthy conflict. Um, and the other thing is you're limiting who you can hire to run your marketing because great marketers don't want to work for a CRO, regardless of what they're called. They want to work for the CEO. So, so, I, I, th so I think it's a brute force approach to the problem. The, the other, for whatever it's worth, the other place I've heard growth applied is not combining sales and marketing, 
but it's more on getting new customers versus existing. Like I've heard that split where it's like, oh, effectively I'm the VP of new business and you're the VP of expansion business. I'm the VP of selling new customers. You're the VP of expanding existing customers. That's a split I actually kind of like. Uh, it's not indicated in all, like in a more transactional business, I think it makes sense, right? In the enterprise business, big deals, long-term relationships probably makes less sense, right? Um, so those are the contexts I've heard uh, the growth officer mentioned it. Great. Um, we're, we need to start wrapping up. Uh, it's been a fun discussion, but uh, before we let you go, I do kind of want to ask you about, um, since we're talking about sales and marketing alignment, how about scaling? What is the balance between building and scaling sales and marketing? So maybe we can look at this from the founders, founders perspective. Like how do you, um, how do you balance that when you start uh, recruiting sales, when do you start recruiting marketing and, and how should those two kind of grow together? It's a big question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. It's fine. Look, it, it's, um, it comes back to a question you asked earlier about what a product oriented founders get wrong. And I said, they oversimplify the funnel, right? They think of the funnel as this very linear thing. And that leads to a misperception of what I call the pipeline chicken or egg problem. What came first, the pipeline or the rep, right? What came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first, the pipeline or the rep? And, and the same founders who will be too linear on the funnel will, will, will say the following. They'll say, I don't want to hire reps until we have the pipeline to support them. It sounds logical. It seems like it makes sense. But in my experience, the in general, the number of opportunities you have in your pipeline is typically a linear function of the number of reps you have because there's a floating bar on opportunity acceptance. When, when I'm starving, I'll take bad opportunities. When I'm flush with opportunities, I'll reject good ones. So the, the, the flaw in the pipeline chicken egg fallacy is that that bar is actually fixed and it's not because if it comes down, if the sole definition of stage two versus stage one is whether a rep accepts it, a rep has a floating bar. So and the floating bar will kind of jam your radar in making this decision. So I, I think because a lot of people would say, ah, hire the marketing first, scale the marketing first so they can build a pipeline and then hire the reps to run in and close it. Um, some people might say the opposite, hire the reps first because I feel better about getting a return on a rep investment than a marketing investment. If we run out of pipeline, we'll go get more. That, that's, a, that's a really bad argument. But that's an argument to have a, what I call the baby Robin problem. You know how baby Robins, they want to get fed. They, they all look up. <laughs> so you have a bunch of reps just looking up, waiting for mommy to drop you know, opportunities in. Um, and and that, that's a terrible problem to have because you have all these starring reps in effect. Um, so I think there's only one answer to that question, which is you plan them together. And it's really hard for people to understand that, but we don't say how many more reps should we hire or how much more marketing should we spend? We say, I want to grow sales two quarters from now from 10 million to 12 million. What do I just take my model? I already have a model of how sales and marketing intersect. I need to use that um, and, and run the, run the two together. It, it, it's an argument by the way, for integrated marketing uh, modeling and, which is actually an argument for integrated ops, right? To have one rev ops function, because if you go to marketing ops and sales ops, right? Now you've got two models and we're going to be back to the pipeline chicken egg, right? Whereas if there's one model, one rev ops team, you just say, how do I make sales go up two quarters from now? They'll give you an integrated answer. So to so me, integrated is the only answer to that question. Fantastic, brilliant. Right, should we right. move on to the so, final segment? Final, final segment, which is the fast five. So I'm going to ask you five simple questions and hoping to get five simple answers. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, what book or books are you currently reading? So I'm currently finishing a book I love called The Crux uh, by Richard Rumelt. His prior book was Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. Fantastic, my favorite book on strategy. A SaaS company you love and why? I have four children. I love them all equally. I, I, I work with scores of SaaS companies. <laughs> I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> okay. So what is your favorite place to read about growth? Uh, in my office here in Oregon. All right. So uh, what is the most important growth metric in your opinion? CAC ratio. The, the dollars of sales and marketing investment spent to acquire a dollar of new ARR. Excellent. And the final one. 
What is your best piece of advice for fellow SaaS marketers? Three words. I first heard them in 1980 and built my career based on them. Make sales easier. Brilliant. Well, that was a whirlwind. I We loved so much talking to you, Dave, and thank you so much for coming on, on our podcast. Well, thanks. Thank you so much, Rita. And say yeah, it was a pleasure. Uh, I had a lot of fun. That's it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Let's keep the conversation going on Twitter at SARS Growth Hub or LinkedIn at the SARS Growth Hub podcast. And if you don't want to miss the next episode, make sure you subscribe to the Growth Hub on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud or right here on YouTube.